sharing here um, from the perspective of the work I've been doing in application of genomics to cancer, which is a little bit different from nutrition. Um, and at this point in the talk, I'm supposed to have you know, a bulleted list with an outline of topics. And as I was preparing that, I couldn't find a better summary of what I wanted to talk about than the title of this Clint Eastwood movie. So we'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in public data sharing and genomics. And we're going to start with somebody who's clearly one of the good guys. Uh, microarrays, the technology that got me into the field of bioinformatics, uh, were invented basically by Pat Brown at Stanford in the mid to late 90s. Uh, they're used for genome-wide gene expression studies. And what's important in the context of today's talk is that Pat was an early proponent of open access to large biological data sets. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Public Library of Science, which is part of his commitment to open access to information in general. And he established a culture very early of data sharing among people using microarrays to study cancer. And some of the evidence of how successful this was was that certainly by 2001, there were standards in place for how you would describe a microarray experiment, uh, Miami being the minimum information about a microarray experiment. And there were databases in place, like the one at Stanford, to make microarray data available to researchers around the world. And I did a screenshot, I'm not sure how legible this is, of the two major data repositories for these big biological data sets right now. The Gene Expression Omnibus, GEO, at the National Cancer Institute, and Array Express at the European Bioinformatics Institute. And inside those red circles are the summary numbers. Uh, both of these databases now contain more than 44,000 data sets and more than a million individual sample data, assay data. So there's a lot of public data out there uh, looking at gene expression in cancer and elsewhere. And so you might think that there's a lot of treasure there that you should go looking for. We don't, as Indiana Jones said, uh, have a map to where the treasure is, and X never marks the spot. Uh, but we do want to start looking. And so the first example I want to give is some idea of how much of this public data is really useful. So this is a paper published by my postdoc, Wen Ting Wang, last year in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. And the main result of this paper is that if you're predicting drug response based on signatures and models that you've learned from cell lines and applying them to predict which patients will respond to which drugs. Well, you can do that in a way that's better than chance, but at least right now, not in a way that's good enough to change clinical practice. And I think that's the result that got it accepted at JNCI, but the really important result for the context of this talk um, is how hard it was to find useful data sets in GEO. So we started very simply with a, you know, these, there were close to 40,000 data sets in there when we started this. And our first criterion was to look at data sets that had at least 100 arrays uh, of a particular type, the Affymetrix U133, which is probably during this period of time the most commonly used array to study human samples. Um, and there were only 200 three studies in GEO at the time that had at least 100 Affymetrix U133 arrays. Now some of those actually turned out to have duplication because the same data set was listed you know, as a sub, for subgroup analyses more than once, and so we reduced that. And then we looked at ones that actually had patient tumors. There was no easy query of GEO to separate those. You could get human samples, but you couldn't find whether they were patient tumors as opposed to human cell lines or normal human counterparts. And then we looked at ones where there weren't replicate experiments, where we actually had 100 different patients involved. And then you looked at whether you had clinical data. You had to know how each person was treated and what the outcome was for individual patients. And that was actually rarely there. This combination of information got us down to only 23 studies that we could look at. And then, because we were looking at drug response, we had to actually have data for those drugs on the cell lines with a wide enough range of values to use. And it turned out that this paper in JNCI, starting with every data set in GEO and Array Express, is actually about three studies that met all our criteria. 
So the first warning is that even if you have people sharing the data, finding useful data may be hard. But there is a lot of useful data out there, and you can use it to answer a bunch of questions. You can, for example, look for big mistakes, big, huge mistakes uh, that people may have made. And that's one of the things that people worry about to some extent. I am going to give an example here of some data like this. Uh, the study that the, the paper that started this was published in a luxury journal known as The Lancet in 2002. Chip Petricoin at the FDA and Lance Leota at the National Cancer Institute um, claimed that using proteomic <coughs> patterns from serum, they could diagnose ovarian cancer. And they could distinguish it not only from serum from healthy women, but serum from women who had other benign ovarian disease, cysts, things like that. So certainly if this were true, it would be a major advance in cancer screening and treatment. The difficulty with ovarian cancer is that most women are diagnosed at a late stage when it's very hard to cure. It's way right too far to operate in many cases. And if you can diagnose it early, <coughs> surgical cures are available. So this was very promising. And given the spirit of, of the time from the microarray experience, and as relevant to today's discussion, every piece of data that they collected, they put up on a public website that you could access. So we got the data and we looked at it. And this is actually, uh, in a heat map, all of the data from their published experiment. The top group, so each row is an individual sample. Um, the columns are, well, it doesn't matter whether it's time points or mass, but it's part of this, it's the result of this proteomics experiment. The top block of samples are cancer. The middle large block are the normal healthy controls. And the bottom labeled other are the women with benign disease. And so the first thing I want to point out is we're taking a 30,000 foot look at the data. And it's clear, I think, even to the people in the very back row, that the other benign disease look different from the cancers or the normals. So the fact that they could distinguish them, well, that's not hard from the data. Any idiot can tell that the ones in the bottom look grossly different, even at the 30,000 foot level, than either the cancers or the normals. But I would also draw your attention to the fact that you probably can't see a systematic difference between the cancers and the normals. So you might ask yourself why benign disease would be so different from cancer or normal. Shouldn't it be more like normal? Really? Well, there's an interesting fact about this particular study. Um, this was performed on what was called an H4 chip from Cyphergen. And the company discontinued the chip after they'd done the initial study. But because they wanted to apply this in the future, they redid the experiment on another chip known as the WCX2. And the samples are in the exact same order in this particular plot. The cancer's at the top, the normal's in the middle, the benign disease at the bottom, and the distinction has disappeared. So is it something about the chemistry on the chip that made it different? Well, I can remember clearly sitting in my office, bringing these pictures up on the screen and putting one above the other, and realizing that, well, I don't know if they changed anything other than the chip, if there's other parts of the protocol that changed, but I look at that original data set next to the re reproduced data set on the new chip and said, the ones labeled as benign disease in the first data set look a lot more like the second data set. They probably did those later. An obvious conjecture would be they did them in response to some referee's comment that you should have other sorts of controls. And so there was something about the order in which experiments were done that made the benign disease look different. And the bottom line in this particular data set is that was the problem with the basic experiment. They actually processed all of the controls first, all of the cases afterwards, and everything they were seeing that was different between cancer and normal in their data set was because of technology. Changes in exactly what settings the machine had, reagents, drifted over time. And so they made a big mistake. They forgot one of you know, experimental design 101 principles, which is you randomize the order in which you assay the samples. But the data can tell you this. If you actually have the data and look at the data, you can learn, did they make mistakes? 
Now, we're now going to look at another example. Um, because sometimes when you have the data, um, you start asking yourself, are the researchers who reported this initially using the same methods I'm using? That's part of the difficulty of reporting the methods that we've raised. And sometimes you even ask if they're using the same data that you're using. So the example here is the, the Duke story that David mentioned in his introduction. The initial paper on this that got our attention was published in Nature Medicine in 2006, and maybe another luxury journal. Um, Anil Pody and Joe Nevins at Duke led the research team doing this. And their main conclusion was that they could use microarray data from cell lines, the NCI60 cell lines in particular, and they could define drug response signatures. And when they use those signatures and apply them to actual patient samples, they can accurately predict who will respond to which drug. And again, if this is correct, it's going to revolutionize the treatment of cancer because they claim to have solved the essential problem of personalized medicine, which drug do we give to which patient. And they provided examples using seven common chemotherapeutic agents. And again, <coughs> the important point for today's talk is that all of the data they used was already available in public archives. They actually generated zero items of new data for their paper. Everything was already published. All they did was a new analysis. So we, that's Keith Baggerly and I at MD Anderson at the time, got the same data and were unable to reproduce the results. So I'm going to show you a few of the things that we learned about this. Uh, here, the upper left panel is a figure from their paper looking at the drug 5-fluorouracil. The columns are cell lines. The rows are genes, and it's sorted so that the sensitive cell lines are to the left and the resistant cell lines are to the right. And you see a clear pattern, this checkerboard pattern of you know, hot, high values of yellow and red that separate the cold, blue, and green values. These genes clearly distinguish those two groups of cell lines. The middle figure is what we got when we took the same data and the list of genes from their supplementary material and just plotted what should be the identical heat map. There are subtle differences between it that you might be able to detect if you look carefully. Uh, the figure on the right is that we then started doing our own analysis. We did t-test, select the genes, pick the same number that they had, and got qualitatively the same figure. So clearly there was something odd about the data. And we did some work to actually list the probe set IDs, they weren't gene names, these were Affymetrix probe set IDs, in their list of genes and in our list of genes. And we looked at them for a while and realized that the numerical part of this was off by one in many cases. Um, and then it turned out to be the case that there was an off by one error. And we looked at ways to verify this across the various drugs that they looked at. And we figured that if this off by one error was our hypothesis of an off by one error was correct. And if you shifted by one and looked at the p values from our t test, those should all be small. And that was true for 5 fluorouracil. And you can see here for topotecan and etoposide that all of the p values for those genes that they listed after correcting for the off by one are small. And when you start looking at adriamycin or Paclitaxel, docetaxel, you start seeing some of the p values aren't small. So that the off by one correction doesn't explain everything. There are these outliers. And so we looked at these other genes, these outliers, in particular in the case of docetaxel, where they had a sample of patient tumors that they were using to validate their signature. Turned out that there were 19 outliers in their 50 gene list. 14 of them occur sequentially in the published list from the paper initially describing the data that they had gotten to do this validation. Um, and the other five, well, they're named here, and they have the unique characteristic that they are also named in the discussion for reasons why you should believe the signature. So our conclusion at this point is at least that there's something funny going on with the genes they are picking out. We also looked at the sample labels, and this is a little bit hard to explain, but it's not terrible, because in one of the data sets, 
they claimed that they were looking at women with ovarian cancer treated with pemetrexid. And this was a subgroup of 59 samples picked out of a bigger set already in GEO of 150 samples. And initially, we didn't know which ones they were. And eventually, they posted on their website data that would allow us to identify which 59 samples they were. So we made a heat map of correlations where the 59 samples are across the horizontal axis. And all 150 samples in the bigger data set are vertical. And they're ordered in such a way that the first 59 are the ones that are supposed to match based on the sample labels. And so the blue diagonal is where the correlation should be high. And the red pixels are where the correlations actually are high. And you notice, first of all, none of the red pixels are on the blue line where you expect them. So all of the sample labels are wrong. Uh, 43 of them match something in the data set, but they match not the sample that's labeled as. And anything that matches something above the vertical black line means that that's someone who was treated with a different drug. So whether the outcome label is the same or not is irrelevant because it's not the same treatment. And 16 of them don't match anything at all, it turns out, because there was something wrong with the order of the genes in the data set. So all 53 were wrong. Clearly, the sample labels and the outcomes were changed. And the bottom line here is that as of sometime in 2012, the last time I checked, they had retracted 10 papers. They had corrected, at this point, six papers, either in, in some way. Uh, they had canceled three clinical trials that they were running based on this. Um, and so the lesson for why having public data available here is that you can uncover misconduct, where people have manipulated So that's sort of fundamentally you know, two anecdotal situations and cases <laughs> where we use the data to find mistakes or to find misconduct. And so you might ask yourself how widespread this is. Is it like there are valets everywhere? Or is this a rare occurrence to find this kind of either mistakes or misconduct? And in some sense, problems with the data or the methods seem ubiquitous. One example of that that goes to some of the earlier talks we've heard today is that Oxer et al. in 2008 reviewed uh, deposition rates at GEO and Array Express for journals that require authors to make their data available using the Miami standards. And they found that even in those journals that supposedly require making the data public, uh, fewer than half of them were actually available. So if it's not enforced, it doesn't happen. So that's the first lesson. The other example I'll give here is a paper out of John Ioannidis' group in 2009, who collected 18 microarray studies with the data and tried to reproduce them, and they succeeded exactly twice in fully reproducing the results. And in 10 of them, even in principle, the methods were described so inadequately that they had no chance of reproducing. So it's more than data, it's also methods. And even if you know the methods, this paper's from Dupuy and Simon and JNCI in 2007, um, they started with a list of known statistical mistakes that people could make analyzing microarray data. And then they surveyed everything that they could find in a certain time period. They found you know, 42 articles to look at, and half of those made at least one serious statistical mistake. And part of the issue here is that these were papers where you could tell from the description of the methods what they actually did. And so you know that they did something wrong because they told you that. So I think that the lesson here so far uh, is that uh, mistakes are common. And there was a survey in Nature in 2005, it would be nice to update this, that looked at you know, thousands of NIH-funded scientists and assured them of anonymity in answering these questions. And you know, three tenths of a percent admitted to falsifying data. That's fairly small until you start thinking about how many scientists there are. That's still a lot of falsified data. And 1.4 percent admitted to plagiarism. But there's, from my perspective, even more important: almost 11 percent deliberately withheld details of either the methodology or the results. And 
more than a quarter had inadequate record keeping. In some ways, some people deliberately wouldn't tell you what they did, and many more could not tell you exactly what they did. <coughs> so I think this is a fairly large problem. And the summary at this point is, you know, a few people cheat. Uh, that's not actually the biggest problem. Many people make mistakes, and I think everyone could benefit from better record keeping. So the argument that we would make at this point, that I have made repeatedly, that I would continue to make now, is we'd like all of the data publicly available. Um, the code used to do the analysis should be part of what's made publicly available, because that's the real science when you're analyzing big data sets. Um, all of the assay data should be made publicly available. And that works in GEO when people put the assay data there. But the lessons from the first paper I talked about is that a lot of the clinical data is missing there. And part of the issue with that may relate to what HIPAA will let US scientists make available and what the IRB will allow people to make available. And part of it's people want to not necessarily make it easy for others to use their data for additional analyses. So I think that there are cultural issues there as well. But I want to use this idea of what HIPAA and the IRB will allow to go into one other example where I'm going to look more at genetics than genomics. Um, there's no gene for fate or for the human spirit as we've learned in this particular movie. Uh, the example I want to talk about is the last one I do. Uh, it comes from a paper published in Science last year. Uh, Listen, didn't write it all. And the reason this is important is that they looked at sequence data, individual genomes that had been made publicly available, and combined it with other existing public databases to completely identify several of the individuals whose genomes had been sequenced. So, I'll talk a little bit about the methods here to give an idea of what they had to do. But the point is that they started with part of what's called the Thousand Genomes Project. And they took 32 samples in particular there that were part of what's called the HapMap Project. Happily mapping. There's been a project for a long time to sequence normal variation across individuals. And these particular 32 samples are labeled as CEU, which means these are Caucasians of European descent living in Utah. You might want to make speculation about the religious affiliations of the individuals, but that's not relevant to this particular discussion. And so they use that sequence data with a method known as lobster to get what are called Y-chromosome STRs. STRs are short tandem repeats. On every chromosome, there are these regions where there are these small bases that get repeated variable number of times in different individuals. They mutate over time to get an extra repeat. And so some people may have 10 copies, some people may have 12, depends on how it is. But this is inherited, it's on the Y chromosome, so it helps you track what's going on in male lineage. And so the first thing they had to do was to show that they could get accurate STRs out of the sequence data. And so they showed that. And based on the quality of the sequence data available at the time, they figured about 10 of these were good enough to proceed with. So they picked the 10 best. Now I will also point out that since this study has appeared, which is about a year ago, um, sequencing capabilities have increased. And so the ability to get better why STR data has only increased. At this point, the sequencing depth and the lengths of reads are good enough that you can probably get this data from any complete sequencing that gets done. So then the point is that they went to some of the existing genealogy databases, the particular ones that they looked at, Y-Search and SMGF, they considered some others. But these are databases where people go and they want to track their ancestors, and so they put information about their or their relatives Y chromosome short tandem repeats into here. And so you can query by STR and what you can get back is people's surnames. Now this is more successful for relatively rare surnames. 
last name is West or Snyder, it's probably not going to work because that's a big enough pool that's actually variable enough that you don't find it as well. If your name is Craig Venter and you sequenced your own genome, your name is going to come back from this, almost for sure. Okay? So they got surnames. And then they looked at another set of public databases. You may have looked at yourself from time to time. People Finders or US Search, where you can go to try to identify by surname and maybe by some other information. The information they needed here was the age and the state to query these together with the surname. So you look for everybody named Venter in California of a certain age and you get somebody back. Um, the reason they had the ages of these individuals is that the samples used in that HAP map and the Thousand Genomes Project are linked to the Coriel cell repository where you can still go and request some of their blood that's stored there to do scientific experiments on. And in that database, the year of birth is recorded because HIPAA does not consider the year of birth as protected information. The date of birth is, but the year is not. So together with the age that they knew, the short tandem repeat that they got by putting the sequence through another public database, and the state which they could infer because it was likely to be Utah, given where these samples were known to come from. They could query people finders or US search and actually identify individuals. Now, if you don't have some of that information, it's not going to work as well. But five of the 10 people that they started with the YSDRs, they got individual names. Now, even if that's five out of 30, that's a lot. So part of the warning here, and I'm going to skip this slide because it just says some of the details if somebody wants to look at it later of what I just said. Um, there was a lot of reaction to this because when these people consented for the science, they were told that it was highly unlikely that the sequence data could be traced back to them individually. So the initial reaction in letters to the science over the next couple of weeks focused on issues of consent. So what do the consent forms have to look like when people give you this data to sequence and allow you to make it public? Focus on issues of law, because at least in the US, federal law prohibits insurance companies from using genetic information to make decisions about health insurance, but they don't restrict its use in long-term care insurance, life insurance, other issues. And there were you know, concerns raised about how the public confidence in the science would go down. That's an issue that nutritionists are probably more commonly dealing with than people in genetics, but it is raised here. Um, and part of the reaction at the NIH was to take the information about the age, the year of birth, and put it into a controlled access portion of the database. So even though HIPAA allowed it, they decided at this point that knowing the year somebody was born, suddenly with sequencing data allowed them to be individually identified. So it was much of this reaction was focused on restricting public data sharing, controlling it, for various reasons. And so I'm going to take one more spin at, at this topic at the end of my talk here and ask you to think about who the data was made for. Okay? And there was an interesting commentary that went along with the Jim Rick article in Science by Laura Rodriguez at and. There are a lot of interesting features there, but I want to draw your attention to two points in particular. One is that we know that data is more likely to be used if there are no restrictions on it. Um, and the example that they give in particular, the HapMath and the Thousand Genomes data are on public data sites with no restrictions at all. You don't have to register, you don't have to sign any forms, you don't have to commit to doing it in any particular way, you just go get it and use it. And there are similar databases, like dbGaP, the database of genotypes and phenotypes, where you have to at least register and let people know who you are before you can access the data. And the thousand genomes data is used much more often than the dbGaP data. Any hurdle, however small, makes it less likely that other researchers will use the data. So that's the first point. But the second point, I think maybe even more relevant, because it asks, why was that data there? If you think about the, the patients who signed the consent, a 
agreed to participate in the study, agreed to make their samples available, agreed to allow them to be sequenced. What did they want done with the data? And to some extent, there is an ethical obligation to make sure that these data collected for these research papers are maximally utilized um, and that it's used for the greatest public good. So there's an argument from what the patient wants to be done with the data that says it should be used in a way that maximally increases our scientific knowledge, which requires sharing. So I'm going to end with some questions here. Um, a lot of the suggestions that we have are somehow technological, administrative, regulatory. Um, we can require authors to deposit data in code. We can require them to register studies. We can have the journals enforce that. And these would all be good things. Um, but it's hard to make those requirements so they don't have loopholes. It's hard to enforce them. And I think that there's more that needs to be done than just changing the rules. You have to at least think about, do we have to change the culture? Do we have to make it, make scientists want to make the data available, make it easier for them to do it, but also make it clear that they will get rewards in some way for doing it and not just penalties for not doing it. And I think that in the context of shifting the culture towards making all of the data and code available, it's important to think about what the patients want what did they think they were getting when they contributed their samples and data to the study? Um, that may or may not be different if they're agreed to participate in some clinical trial and getting treatment as opposed to, yes, you can use whatever's left of my tumor for research. And I also want you to think about um, who owns the data. Is it really the individual researcher who owns it, which is often the attitude, this is my data, you can't have it? Um, or is that person merely the custodian of the data? And I realized at this point that there should be one more movie shot slide at the end to finish up. And having failed to do that, I think all I can do at this point is say, that's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs>